Rook, who's called That Gratitude Guy. Uh, he's been a speaker, teacher, life coach, and best-selling author for over 25 years. Um, he's also a member of Seattle Fork, that is a um, He started out selling suits in Nordstrom, and eventually managed to work his way up to socks. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> managed to work his way up to uh, being, <laughs> being a store manager. Uh, he managed in the corporate world for over 30 years. He's the author of The Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal, Happiness Starts with Gratitude, and Gratitude Nuggets to Chew On. He was recently featured on New Day with Margaret Larson on King TV, and Chat with Women on KIXI Radio. With over 400 gratitude videos posted on YouTube, thousands have seen his message, and he's now considered a leading authority on gratitude and how living a life of gratitude can enhance and improve your life. I was speaking with him as we started the meeting, and we were commenting about how our dogs have a lot who can teach us about gratitude and attitude. Because when they see you in the morning, they're really happy to see you, even if it's only because you're going to open the door to let them outside. But they have the right attitude about every day. So, without any further ado, please help me welcome the Brooker, the gratitude guy, David George Brooks. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> and also, thank you, Ray, for when he and I first met down at Seattle 4 about uh, talking about, I speak to a lot of the Rotaries, and I think I've maybe spoken to half of the 5030 group. In fact, Tim, I remember sitting next to you at Seattle 4 recently, listening to Dale Turner's comments today, too. <clears throat> so let me start off by asking this. How many people here, by show of hands, have suffered a significant personal loss in your life. Okay, thank you. I am very blessed to speak to as little as a half a dozen people. I did a nursing home recently and they, that was all the people that showed up and then I did Gold Creek Community Church a couple weeks ago and it was probably 2,500 people through uh, three services. It's always about 80 or 90 percent of the people that raise their hands. And I'm always amazed and even the high schools I get to talk to, even some of the young kids, I was talking to Ray about issues in the service and so forth, and people that have struggled and had a lot of trauma and loss in their life. Well, let me tell you about my significant personal loss. It was September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday, and I woke up, and I looked over to my right, and Dana, my wife, wasn't there. Now, that's strange. I wonder where Dana is. Just then, Connor, my four-year-old, comes in. Where's mom? I don't know. Let's go find her. So we get out and walk out the bedroom to the hallway. Kyle, my 14-year-old, same question. I don't know. So we look in a couple of rooms, <clears throat> we walk down, and we look downstairs in the front of the washer and dryer, here is Dana, all crumpled over, kind of in the fetal position, it doesn't look good. So we go running down there, I turn her over, it's all this stuff coming out of her mouth, Connor immediately starts crying. I said to Kyle, Kyle, go call the police, go call fire, go call medics. And within a matter of a few minutes, <clears throat> excuse me, there must have been 20 or 25 people in our house. Wires, tubes, those paddles. They had her out in the rec room. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that electronic thing where it shocks your chest and so forth. And as I sat and I watched this, I realized that anybody who's ever been through something like this, one of the things that you notice is that time loses all measure. And I wasn't sure how much time had passed. And this little short fire person comes over to me and says, Mr. Brook, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half. We still don't have a heartbeat. Would you like... Oh, thank you. That's so kind. Would you like us to continue? And I realized at that very moment, never before in my life had I had to make a life and death decision for somebody. I thought about it and I said, no, you can stop. And she was dead. She was 38 years old. And what I realized, too, is not only losing Dana, but what had happened to me is I had had so much loss in my life. My father had been a very prominent attorney in downtown Seattle. He ended up killing himself. Never understood that. My mom had died of cancer. A couple of my best friends were killed at the night we graduated from Queen Anne High School, <clears throat> which is no longer. And just a whole number of them. I lost some friends in Vietnam. 
It just, it was the list is this long. I was mentioning this to Ray too. What made it so tragic to me is half of the people I've lost in my life, at least half of them were their own hand. Suicide, overdoses, frying their liver with booze and all this kind of nonsense that's out there as people try to cope. So as I thought about that, I remember within a couple of days of when Dana died, my, my house was teeming with people, so friends and family, and they're bringing food, and everybody's doing the best that they can. But I remember walking up by myself, and I stood on this little deck on the outside just by myself two or three days later. And when you go in shock, your body's numb, and it doesn't even know how to process it. It's just trying to protect itself. But I realized, I stood there, I stood there and I pinched my skin I just 15 years ago. It feels like five minutes ago. And I thought, I'm just a little guy trying to get through life with two young boys. My wife is dead and all these other people have passed on. And I just stopped for a second and I just looked up to the sky and I thought, now I see why people kill themselves. Because I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. It's just too painful. Connors couldn't stop crying. Where's my mom? Kyle. I was having a heck of a time. My fraternity brothers said, you weren't the same for four or five years after this happened. So as I, as I went through that, I thought, I'm going to have to find something. And I'll get to gratitude in a second, but I will tell you what is so interesting to me. Dana had died of a prescription pill overdose. And I remember we were both working at Nordstrom. and Bill was talking about my history. That's where I met Dana. She got arrested for prescription fraud. I'd never seen anybody in handcuffs before. And then she went into this detox thing for two or three, three different times. As I said, she was 38. So I met this Dr. Dickinson at the treatment center in Everett. He said, are you David Brooke? Are you Dana's husband? Yes, I am. Come on in, sit down. He was almost kind of adamant about it. I want to tell you what's going on. He points out to the room and there's all the people, Dana and the different people. He's a doctor, she's a lawyer, he's a fireman, he's an architect, she's this. They're all addicted to something. He goes, I want to let you know what the odds are. I've been doing this for a long time, as you mentioned. One in 20. We'll make it back to a normal life. That's it. And of the 19 that don't, half of them will be dead within a year. And Dana was 37 at the time, and I thought, there's no way. And she was dead less than a year later. So it just left such an impression on me, and I kept thinking... I have a faith, I was talking to Ray, or was it, it was Bill, I think about this. But depending on the group I get to talk to, I talk to, as I mentioned, a lot of Rotary Chambers, um, Kiwanis, Lions, everything. I feel so blessed. I get to do this two or three times a week to spread this message. I want to get into the military and help there. But faith is always something you have to think about who you're talking to. But that was a huge part of it. But also, what am I going to do to cope? I'm not going to get a gun like my dad did. I'm not going to take pills like Dana did. And I kept thinking that, you know what a lot of this is? It really depends on how you look at something. Now, we've, some of us have got glasses of water or Pepsi or what have you here. But it really does depend on how you look at something. So I'd like just for a second, Florence, you don't have to. I want everybody to stand up if you'd be so kind. Just, so just take a second. There's no audience participation coming to the front. Don't worry. <laughs> but I want you to extend, Florence, you might be able to do this. I want you to extend your right hand and start turning it in a clockwise ma manner. Now there's clock over, a clock over there, if anybody's uncertain of which way clockwise is. You know, and I got a watch on here. Just start turning it clockwise, keep it nice and stretched out, it's always good for us after lunch. Now keep it going clockwise, just start bringing it down real slowly. Keep it going clockwise, keep bringing it down to your head, eyes, chin, chest, and maybe roughly your waist. Now what direction is it going? Bueller, anybody? Counterclockwise. Thank you, Bill. Okay, you can sit down. It's going counterclockwise. So, having been... Thank you, Ray, for doing that. Clell, thank you for that as well. I only got an undergraduate degree from the University of Washington. I have friends of mine that have masters and PhDs that come up to me. Hey, I saw you talk. What's the story on the deal there? Do they, do they change midstream? I go, no, you knucklehead. You're looking at it from the top or bottom. It's, it's clockwise, it's counterclockwise. Seriously? It's just my way of telling people, it just depends. And that's that choice you have. We get up every morning, that's why I like Bill's comment about the dog. You can go left or right. I decided after when I was on that deck and I realized why people killed themselves, I made a decision that day. It's like October 30th. 
November 1st, or October 2nd, I think it was. She died on the 29th. I'm not going to kill myself. I thought about it. It's pretty easy. We didn't live that far from the Aurora Bridge. You just go over there and you walk, you just jump over. But I'm not going to do it. And once you take that off the table, that's great, but you also need some tools in your little toolkit to help you with this because it is tough out there. And having lost so many people, I realized one of the big things for me was I found gratitude to go with my faith. And I found this gratitude journal, which I'll talk about in a minute. But I realized one of the things before that is you have to have an attitude. You can't give up. Winston Churchill, never, ever, ever, ever give up. You can't. But I'll tell you, Connor was four and a half, and he struggled mightily. They were in this little preschool, and it was tough enough for me. I was, we, we ended up losing our house. We had to move in with some friends because the prescription addiction took everything. We lost everything. Money, savings, it was all gone. I got these two little boys I got to raise. What am I going to do? He says, your son is not right. I said, he just lost his mother six months ago, for gosh sakes. Yeah, I know, but he's messed up. So they put him through this big assessment and everything, and they're bouncing balls and all this kind of stuff. And then when they're done, have Connor sit over there. You sit over here. They sat down. They talked to me, and they said, you're going to have a big problem. He's going to need occupational therapy, and he listed to be this stuff this long. He's not going to make it in life. It's exact words. I just lost Dana six months earlier myself, barely getting through the day. So I said the only thing that seemed natural to me, I said, well, I'll tell you what. We're going to go to Roosevelt High School someday, and he's going to be the starting quarterback. I was a pretty decent athlete. She starts laughing. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. No, he's not going to be any athlete. In fact, he's going to struggle in life. He'll never play sports. So I walked out to the car, got into the car with Connor, and I burst out into tears. I couldn't stop crying. I probably cried for 20 minutes. I've always been kind of emotional. Daddy, what's wrong? I can't tell you, Connor. But he kept going out there and he kept trying sports and he didn't succeed. He just would strike out. He couldn't hit the ball. He couldn't run. It was just terrible. I'd watch him in literally T-ball. First of all, it's coach pitch. Then it's T-ball or whichever way. How do you miss the ball on a T? I mean, the ball just sits here like this. And here's Connor swinging up here. And I'm going, Connor, lower. Okay, Dad. Okay. And then he lowers it. Finally, he lowers and he hits the T. The ball dribbles forward. I got to hit. I got to hit, Dad. No, Connor, it's the ball, not the tee. But he kept trying. I noticed that with Kyle, too. I was so impressed. And hopefully I was setting a good example because I wasn't going to check out through suicide or pills or anything. I don't care how much loss I'd sustained. But he just kept trying and trying and trying. I'd go to the games. He wouldn't even start. He'd go, they'd put him up and they'd, he'd uh, strike out. He'd go in the dugout and put his hands in his face, just ball. But I made it to all those games and all those practices and everything. And then we got to May 31st, 2005. He hasn't played. The game is 8-7, to seven, or excuse me, 7-6, to six, the other team. It's bottom of the seventh. And I think, frankly, they were just out of guys. So there's two out. There's two on. It's the bottom of the seventh. The last person up. And guess who comes out of the dugout? Here comes Connor. Now, the other kids aren't paying attention to their parents. But Connor, hey, Dad, I'm up. And I'm just going, Connor, kids don't talk to their parents in the stands. It's not cool. I know I'm there, but just sort of ignore me. He gets up there, ball one, strike one, ball two, strike two, full count. Next pitch just comes ripping in. He just rips it down the third baseline. Goes just inside the bag and third, goes into left field. The guy from third comes in. The guy from second comes, rounds third, and here comes the guy, the ball, the catcher. They all meet at the plate. The guy catches the ball. They all crash together. The ball pops out. They win the game 8-7. to seven. Connor is staying on second base. The entire dugout starts to head out to second base. And what does Connor do from second? Dad, I got a hit! <laughs> I can't even talk. I have such a lump in my throat. I'm so choked up by this episode. They put them on their shoulders and carry them off the field. We got home about an hour and a half later. Still couldn't talk. But I sat him down on the bed. I said, Connor, I want to tell you something. It was never about baseball. It's the fact that you never gave up. He kept trying and trying and trying. He just never gave up. The same kid that was told to me after his parents died, or his mother died, I should say, you're not going to make it in life. Every so often, somebody in the audience will scream out, did you get that gal's name? I didn't, but I'm not sure it would have been important if I had. 
but he just graduated from Bothell High School last year. He's now a freshman in college in San Diego. I miss him tremendously. I had to hold him back a year, but he left in August to go to school, and I know this is a little smaller picture. But he graduated, he was student of the year, ninth grade at Skyview Junior High, and then he graduated with a B plus average, but maybe more importantly, I know education's critical, he was a leadoff hitter on their baseball team, one of the best hitters on the team, and he never gave up. And I just, I think so much of that is so important because we give up so easily. This life thing that we do is a challenge. But there's all these people like Walt Disney that went to 300 banks and Sylvester Stallone. You just hear story after story after story. People that would not give up. So I think it's so important to remember that because I kind of, I look at this, you got to embrace gratitude. You can't give up. But also, you got to remember it takes as long as it takes. I am 63 years old. I will be 64 three weeks from today on the 28th. Now, I know Clell's looking at me going, this guy didn't look a day over 62. <laughs> I, I could just see that look in his face. <laughs> Thank you, Clell. I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19 years old. It's taken me 44 years. It took me a long time. Finally, I have the courage after all this loss and Dana and all the things that happened. I walked out of Lowe's December 27th, 2011, so I'm going to be a speaker. I walked home and Connor goes, well, that's just fantastic, Dad. How are we going to pay the bills? I said, just don't worry. I'll figure it out. But I, just, I decided it takes as long as it takes. Now, when I look at everybody's faces here, and I can see Clell and Jack and Rick and Dale, Florence, Ray, Bill, Tammy, Tim. I got most of the names here today. Every one of your paths are different. And somebody once said to me, don't ever compare yourself to somebody else. It's such great advice. Well, how come they have the money they have? How come they have the car? I want this, I want that. It starts with your own journey. I don't care if it took me 44 years. This is how long it took. I have 40 years worth of stories. I am blessed enough, and I mean blessed, to be able to be one of the featured speakers up at the conference. I got the hold of Ezra recently, and he said, I'd like you to do a breakout for us. And I do a workshop around gratitude and so on. I feel so fortunate. Well, I don't think I would have had 40 years worth of stories if I started this when I was in my 20s. And it's the stories that people relate to. These shoes have walked a parallel path. Ray and I can't walk an identical path, but we can walk parallel ones. And when you lose somebody, when you lose a child, when you lose a spouse, you lose a friend, any of those things, you can't exactly know the experience, but at least you have an idea and you can help somebody. So, and I really realized that, I realized this whole thing about not giving up. But I also realized where it comes from too. So I'd like you to all very quickly, just point to yourselves. Everybody just point to yourself. Okay, thank you. Okay, everybody here pointed right here. Now, my interpretation of that is you're talking to your, you're pointing to your heart. Now you might think, well, doesn't everybody? You'd be surprised how many times I get this. And then I saw one the other day, I looked over the corner. What does that mean? <laughs> But I think it's because it comes from your heart. Now, Dale said something about his hand writing. And one of the things I'm going to talk about in a second on this gratitude journal, I write in it every single day. It's the biggest thing, one of the biggest four or five tools to help change me. But I think it's because it starts with a feeling in your heart. This is the big CPU up here, this brain. Maybe that's where it's gone. But then it goes to your heart, your arm, your hand, to your pen, to the paper. And I write, I am so grateful I had the opportunity to meet Ray Coffey. I'm so grateful I had an opportunity to meet Bill McCauley today, to talk to Dale, etc., etc. It's something visceral about it that goes down there. So this is what happened. I'm struggling mightily. This buddy of mine says, you ever heard of a gratitude journal? Now, how many here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Anybody? Gratitude journal? Anybody ever heard of it? How many have ever heard of a journal? Better. How many have ever seen a journal? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Well, I had never heard of a gratitude journal. So I got one and I started writing in it. I ordered it on Amazon. But first of all, I just ordered it and let it sit there for three weeks, which is ridiculous. I don't know why I ordered it. But I started writing and I noticed all these incredible things happening. So then I was so impressed with what happened, I made my own, the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. I've timed this thing over and over and over again. It takes seven and a half minutes a day. Now, I have a bit of a structure to it. Here's Connor's picture, but I'll show you a blank. 
you know, to see it up close. But the day and the date, this is already set for tomorrow, Wednesday the 8th. Your daily number, I'll get back to that in a second. Current events, special occasions, just two lines. That's just so you can say I had lunch with Ray today at Rotary, whatever, so you don't have to have a diary also. I'm so grateful for. Now you can write on every line or every other line. I don't care if you get a spiral notebook. It doesn't matter to me. You don't have to buy mine. But I will tell you, this will alter the framework of your approach to life. And it's such a healthy coping mechanism. Down at the bottom is your highlight of your day. The best thing that happened to you. If you're writing in the morning like I do, it's typically yesterday. If it's at the end of the day, it's from the day. And then the right hand side is your gratitude intentions. Your subconscious mind cannot distinguish the difference between what you think has happened and what actually happens. You can pre-program. And I talk about this all the time. I'm so grateful to speak to hundreds of people. And then it's that. I'm so grateful to speak to thousands of people. Then that happens. Now I'm so grateful to be speaking to tens of thousands of people. I know it's going to happen because I'm programming it. But it's so incredibly important. So here's what I'd like you to do. The daily number. And I can't do this today because I only have 20 minutes or so. And I, when I do workshops, I pass out paper and do some sort of fun little exercise. But I'd like you to do this. This is what the daily number is. 10 is one of the best days of your life. And one is one of the worst days of your life. So all in that range, what is your number today? I write in my journal and I make my number. So I'd like you to all think about it. No halves, just one to ten. I just want you to think about what your number is today. And every so often people, well, this, like right now, this minute, like Monday, I just, what are you feeling like right now? So just whatever, I don't care. I mean, it was a good lunch. I, that's, I'm feeling good just about that. I'm blessed I was here. That puts me in a good mood. So get that number in your head. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'm just going to do this in your brains, if you will. So now I'd like you to, to think about this. If you're a one to five, I don't want you to raise your hand. If you're having a tough time, I, I do a lot of talks. I see people crying and different things happen. They've just lost somebody. I, I don't want to upset people, but it's just, I feel so powerfully oh, about this gratitude subject and how it can help you. So how many people in the room are a six? Any sixes? Okay. How many sevens? Okay, a few. How many eights? A few more. Nines. Okay, and tens. One ten. Uh, Noah, what's your name? Rob. Rob. Okay. Thank you, Rob. So here's what I'd like you to think about. Now, again, I usually, I usually like to do this on paper, but I want you to think about just this one thing. What is the one thing you're most grateful for right now today? I'm not giving you any hints. It could be different from Rob to to Bill, to Tammy, to whoever. I want to think about what's the one thing you're most grateful for. Okay, so plant that in your brain. Now second, I want you to think, what is the second most thing you're grateful for? I know what a lot of these are because I've done this enough to know, but I don't like to give any ideas. So you got most grateful and second most grateful. Now the last thing I want you to think about is what was the highlight of your day yesterday? What was the best thing that happened to you? Florence, you mentioned something about grandchildren. Oh, I'm not supposed to give any hints. So just rethink that. Most grateful, second most grateful, and the highlight of your day yesterday. Rob, you're already there, so you're excused from this competition. <laughs> so just think about those three things. It's so much better if you write them down, but again, this is fine. Put them in your brain. Now, I want you to think about your daily number now. After thinking about one and two and that highlight of your day yesterday. Same rules. One to five, don't raise your hand. Now, we didn't have any sixes before. How many sevens? One, two, Steve. What's your name? Joe. Joe, Steve and Joe. How many eights? Okay, a few more. How many nines? And tens? Well, Rob was a ten before, so I got one extra ten. So many times, the seven, eights, and nines always go up a number or two. Just by focusing on that, when you sit down and write down, I'm so grateful. Now, does anybody want to take a guess what the number one answer is that people tell me they're grateful for? Their health. Correct. Thank you, Joe. Always, always, always health is number one. Because without our health, physically, mental health, whatever it might be, it's pretty difficult to navigate through life. But we also tie here a lot about families and friends and spouses and children and a roof over the head. Bill mentioned in my intro, I do a video every single day on gratitude. Every single day, and I've got almost 450 now or something on YouTube. They're just two minutes long. In fact, I, I send out the feature one every Monday at 745. And if you're interested in getting it, I've got a sign up over there. You just put your name and your email, and I send it out. went out yesterday at 745. Yesterday was making excuses 
and this morning was uh, reevaluate. It was a great time to reevaluate those big areas of your life. But the reason I bring that up is because every so often somebody says to me, How do you think of a new subject every day? <laughs> I go, Really? Gratitude? What happened to Dave Brooke? You know, he ran out of subjects. And he's. <laughs> He is grateful, but he's sitting at Starbucks and he's just staring at the coffee machine. <laughs> looking for some... I, I mean, I did one on... Look how cold it is. You guys see the rest of the country? I'm just grateful for my furnace. Minus 59. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's oh, incredible. Water. Yeah, exactly. A good friend, somebody that'll listen to you. Makes such a big difference. So, I tell people all the time, I urge you. Now, I sell these gratitude journals. I sell books. I do a lot of speaking, as I mentioned. You can buy mine. These are $15. I used to give them away, but then I noticed people don't write them in as much. But if you charge them $15, boy, they write in the next day. It's amazing. But if you want to get this great, if not, you can get a spiral. I don't care. But I will tell you what an impact this has made on me. My mother, to go with everything else that happened to me, was manic depressive. And it just, oh gosh, she would threaten suicide and all these things before she died of cancer. But I remember... There's one day, she used to call me a lot and she'd take like her pills and she'd shake them. She goes, these are all sleeping pills. I'm taking all these unless you come over and see me right now. Just, she'd just shake them. I can still hear it today a whole bunch of times. So I'd leave the University of Washington or the bookstore where I was working. I'd go over and see her. What do you do with somebody who's suicidal? I just sit there. I don't know. But I think I got some of that manic depressive stuff from my mom. Well, as well you can imagine, I'm not drinking stuff, I'm not going to have a pill, I'm not going to do it, because I, I just saw what it's done to so many people, most of all my wife. So one day I woke up and I was going to the Burlington Chamber of Commerce a year and a half ago, and I was probably a two. I was so incredibly depressed, and I just thought, what is going on with me? This is ridiculous, but I'm not going to take something. I just, I just, it was against everything I'd seen, too many things happen. So I didn't even take a shower. I got my gratitude journal. I went down to Starbucks and I wrote my gratitude journal. And I felt a lot better. It bumped me up to about a four or five. That was better. But then I go to the chamber. It was a good sized chamber. I'd say maybe a couple hundred people. And afterwards, I love doing these talks. But I must tell you, I almost love more the stories I hear afterwards from people that come up and talk to me. Let me tell you what happened to me. Total stranger they've never met, and they just pour their heart out. It's one of the most incredible things. It's far beats running a Lowe's or running a Nordstrom or anything else I've ever done. Can't even touch it. Doesn't pay as much money, but it's still. But no, but the thing that was interesting is that I went to the talk, and after I was done, the people, they were all lining up, and I'm signing books and things like this. And this gal comes in, and she's crying. She goes, you just changed my life. I said, what's your name? She goes, my name is Janice. I said, well, Janice, I don't know if I just changed your life. I might have given you some tools. I said, what was it that I said? She goes, well, one of your stories I don't want to talk about. It's going to get me too upset, but I just want to let you know you just altered the course of my life with your little talk today. I said, well, thank you. We got it. I got a hug, and I think she got a journal and a book or something. So I go out to the car. I'm up in Burlington, as I mentioned. I get back in the car, and I realize now I'm a nine and a half. I went from a two to a four or five to a nine and a half, and I didn't take one sip of alcohol or pills or all this other stuff that people use to cope. And I sat there, and I was just so proud of myself. I had a big smile on my face, and I thought, if any of you here ever want to know who your closest friend is in this world, yeah, I'm sure a lot of you know this, just think about who's the first person you call when you get good or bad news. So I wanted to call Connor. I was going to call Connor first and Kyle second, my four-year-old now, 19 and 29 and tell him. But I decided not to. I'm just going to enjoy this myself. And I'm driving back down towards Seattle and I take the rear view mirror and I turn it towards myself and I don't care if this is embarrassing. And I went, I'm so freaking proud of you. You know what, you know what I was doing prior to that? Where are the hammers and nails, folks? Uh, where can I find the boards here at Lowe's? Uh, can you tell me where the skill saws are? I don't care if I was store manager. I don't think I got to change lives like I did now. But guess what did it? Framing it in gratitude. So I tell people all the time. And then the young kids, I get to go to schools. You know what they ask? Yeah, this is super. Uh, do you have an app for that? <laughs> and the funny thing is, I have an app. And I just refuse to sell it. I can press it. The Brooker, that gratitude guy. I'm so grateful that I got to meet Florence and Clell and Ray and sit at their table today. It'll type it right up. And you just hit it and it puts it in there. It's not the same. It's just not the same. 
course, I won't even get started when people don't look people in the eye anymore. I do, as I mentioned, a lot of the, you know, the phones. I get to do a lot of these presentations, as I say, two or three a week. And the number one question I get, do you need a projector and a screen? No. I want to look at every single person. I want to see those eyes. Right, Jack? Thank you. Joe, thank you for being a 10. No, Joe. Rob, sorry. Joe's there. Thank you for being a 10. It makes such a big difference. And all I tell people is, after you've embraced gratitude, understand it takes as long as it takes. Get rid of the junk that's in your brain. Get a gratitude journal. And then the last thing is, and I'll wrap up, is sharing gratitude. How many people have a cell phone here? Probably, again, most everybody. Now, I'm not going to do it today, because, again, we don't have time. And we started a bit early, and I want to wrap up in a couple minutes. And you always try to start and finish right on time. But I'd like you to do an exercise for me later today. Just promise me you'll do this. I call this the four T's. I want you to text, tweet, telephone, or tell somebody how grateful you are to have them in their life, have them in your life. Now, I do this lots of times live when I have more time. And I'm not kidding you. I can hear pretty well from the... And just, I don't know. Some speaker just says I'm supposed to tell you how much I love you. <laughs> I mean, I... Okay, that's all right, but they get the point across, and then there's tweeting, but those are the four T's. Do that later today. If they ask you, you can tell them that it's some speaker said to do it, but you'll be amazed what you'll hear. And I think we all would agree that the majority of time, we don't do that enough. At least that's what I noticed. But there's something about sharing gratitude. That's why I do what I do, because I get to share this incredible message. Embracing gratitude, get rid of the junk in your brain. In fact, notice too, when you go out to your cars today, the windshield is like four feet by about two feet. It's big. Maybe four and a half feet. Notice how big the rear mirror is. It's about this big. That's about a hundred to one deal. So kind of keep that in proportion. Mostly look forward. Learn a little bit from the past. If you're looking in the rear view mirror and you see some blue lights, pull over. <laughs> but mostly pay attention to what's in front of you. I find people in workshops all the time. They drive over something, they take it from behind them, they put it in front of them, and drive over it again. Same old story about the ex-wife, the ex-husband. Just move on. You know, that's why we tend to look forward. I think that's why the good Lord put our eyes in the front of our head. So the last thing I would leave is just think about that sharing gratitude. I look at so many things in my life, I get so much unbelievable joy and pleasure and I feel so blessed to share this message and give people an opportunity. If I get through to one person today, there's one more than yesterday. And I get to do these big groups and it's just thrilling to me. But I tell them, you got to share it. I once decided I was going to, I never did drugs, never smoked dope, coke, all that nonsense, but I was an adrenaline junkie. I learned how to fly, I raced a hydroplane, my brother and I were national champions. I did all this crazy stuff. So I decided one day we're going to jump out of some airplanes. So I get eight of my buddies to make an appointment for Brook, party of eight, Issaquah. So about the Wednesday before that Saturday, two of them call me, they can't make it. Now we're at six. And then on Friday, two more dropped off. And then on Saturday morning, I pick up my phone. Hey, Dave, it's Bob. <coughs> I think I have a sore throat. I walk into Issaquah skydiving and proudly walk up to the counter and go, Brooke, party of eight. He looks at me and goes, uh, where's all your friends? I said, uh, I don't have any. And guess who skydived by himself? I have the picture. All by myself. Everybody else bagged out. I didn't get to share that with anybody. It was so sad. So when you get to share it, it expands the effect so much. And when somebody tells me, Think about this, Ray, I'll never forget when you said this, Bill, I always remember when you said that, Tammy, you're the first person that hit Rotary that said this. Any of those types of things, that's the benefit of sharing something. I learned how to fly when I was young. And I was a VFR pilot, I still fly occasionally. VFR means visual flight rules, you can't be in the clouds. And I got caught between these two cloud layers in ocean shores, and I was going about 150 knots. And I just got caught, and I knew, oh, I'm in trouble. I, I got to get out of here. And then all of a sudden, this sunlight right over the ocean, the sunlight comes in, hits the two clouds, and I'm just hanging on to this yoke for dear life. Just hanging on to it. And these clouds, the sun came in, and this color was going like this, and it was just unbelievable. And then it must have been maybe 30 seconds, felt like five minutes. And then, bam, I pop out of it, and I'm out over the ocean. There's the sun, the water, the sand. 
And I went, wasn't that the coolest thing you've ever... Did you see the blue, the red, the, that green, the bolt, the yellow, the whole thing? Oh, I was flying by myself. <laughs> Another embarrassing thing, but I was. But I will tell you that I always was sad that nobody else got to see that except me. But it reminded me, skydiving by myself or flying or whatever, you got to share gratitude. And the last thing I'll say too, I always give away a book and typically I draw business cards but I know you guys have the the deal so we'll draw one if we could for a book but I also want to let you know that it's so important to understand the role that you have in the work that you do and again corporate jets with Nordstrom's owner's box with Seahawks I can only imagine if I was still working when they owned them I could have gone to the Super Bowl all that crazy stuff doesn't matter but I'm proud of the journal I'm proud of books I've done and so forth but I never have gotten too carried away with it because typically, I'll get business cards, and as I say, we'll do just the coupon here. And this happened to me a couple months ago, and so the business cards, and Sally Smith. So everybody claps, I, I pull her card out, and she walks up to the big room, I hand her the book, and it goes, good going, Sally, you won the free book. And I give her the book, and she turns to walk back to her table. I said, you know, if you'd like, I'll sign that for you later. She goes, that's okay. <laughs> so clearly, it wasn't that big a deal. But it's so important to know, my feeling is this. There's a lot of ways you can cope out there. This life is very challenging. Death, destruction, loss, stress, all this kind of thing. But I feel that gratitude can transform a life. It can change a life. And in my case, I feel it saved my life. One of three or four things that really saved it. Otherwise, I don't think I'd be here today. And I just tell people, I, I ask you, give it a try. It can save your life too. Thanks a lot. David, do we have a couple of minutes for questions?